of expanding on that. So what Catherine's referring to is the EU Withdrawal Act 2018 passed by Parliament. And this applies the principle of continuity of the law. So the basic philosophy of the 2018 Act is that the day after exit from the EU, our law will be exactly the same as it was the day before exit. So the mere fact of exit doesn't change the law, it merely gives the UK the ability to change its law going forward. Now the effect of the 2020 Act um, is to postpone that the operation of that principle from the date of exit from the EU, which was the end of January uh, 2020, to the end of the transitional period, 31st of December 2020. So currently, we're still operating under the basic regime of the 2018 Act. So the mere fact that we've left the EU has not changed our law one iota, except in certain marginal respects. Um, which don't concern us today. But as a basic proposition, our law stays the same. And that will be true after the 31st of December. And the way this is done is, as Catherine has explained, is via the concept of what's called retained EU law. And basically, in simple terms, what the 2018 Act does <coughs> is to incorporate all EU law into UK law with effect from the date at which we leave. So everything that was part of EU law now becomes UK law. So it's still the law, nothing's changed, but all that happens is that Parliament is free to legislate to change the law in the future. So we have an example that's been announced this morning where the so-called tampon tax, 5% VAT on sanitary products, which is the minimum threshold under EU VAT legislation, apparently in the budget next week, it's going to be announced that after the 31st of December, that will be reduced to zero, taking use of the freedom of leaving the EU. But the law only changes if Parliament says it changes. So absent legislation, then it all stays the same. But of course, that's looking at it from the legislative perspective. Then you get, what about case law? Because, of course, as everybody knows, the, the pra in practical terms, law doesn't just depend on legislation, it depends on case law. So case law is also retained EU law. So at present, EU law is supreme, and the supreme arbiter of EU law is the Court of Justice of the European Union. So everything that the Court of Justice of the European Union says is binding on the UK courts. After the 31st of December, it will no longer be binding as regards future judgments, but past judgments will stay binding, subject to two wrinkles. Wrinkle number one is what the 2020, 2018 Act said. So the 2018 Act said that the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom would have the freedom to depart from those precedents on the same basis that it departs from its own precedents. So the practical effect of that is, in, rea in real terms, to bake in all the existing Court of Justice case law. Now, that has the merit of certainty, the demerit of making it harder to change decisions that you don't like. So, for example, take the Mitsubishi case that Catherine talked about, in which the Court of Justice has said that not using a trademark is use of a trademark. <laughs> Some people think that this is balmy. <laughs> but presently, that authority is binding on all courts in the UK. Under the 2018 arrangement, you could go to the Supreme Court to say, this is balmy, please change that doctrine. And in principle, you could do that. But of course, you'd have to have a case you'd have to take it all the way to the Supreme Court and you'd have to persuade the Supreme Court that that was a good situation in which to depart from what the Court of Justice had previously said. Now, that is where we stood under the 2018 Act and there are all kinds of complications with that once you start thinking about it. So, 
Let me just illustrate that, that point a little further. In many of these situations, the legislation will not have changed. So you're faced not only with going to the Supreme Court to get the Supreme Court to adopt a different interpretation, but ex hypothesi in circumstances where the legislation has not been changed by Parliament. So you've got to then ask yourself, well, why should the Supreme Court be persuaded to adopt a different interpretation when the legislation has not changed? Now, if you think it's a balmy decision like Mitsubishi, then you might say, OK, you've got a good shot. But if it's a more marginal call, why should you, why should you get that? Particularly in circumstances where the way, the way in which the Court of Justice operates is what they call a dialogue with the national courts. So they don't operate strict precedent. Their case law evolves over time, even though the legislation doesn't change. So if you have a whole series of decisions on a particular topic, the case law doesn't say static. It evolves over time. So take communication to the public in the context of copyright, where so far we've got 20 to 25 decisions. And over time, the case law has evolved. Now, we know that in the future it will continue to evolve. Now, what are you going to do in the UK? Are you going to ignore the future evolution? In which case you're going to be freezing the course of justice's jurisprudence at an arbitrary point in time, or are you going to continue to, to follow it, given that it will evolve in the future? Now we get the complication of the 2020 Act. The 2020 Act says this. We, the government, are going to take the power to direct that lower courts can depart from judgments of the Court of Justice. Now, you can see the sense of that in one point, from one perspective, which is, suppose the government exercises that power, and suppose it survives constitutional challenge before the Supreme Court, because, of course, there's an obvious objection to that. It's a Henry VIII clause writ large. So query whether that would survive a constitutional challenge under Supreme Court doctrines that already exist. But let's assume it does. You can see there's practical merit to it in the sense that you don't have to go to the Supreme Court to get a change in the way in which the law is interpreted. So from that point of view, you can see there's a good argument for it. The downside to it is you have a Pandora's box scenario, because let's suppose you say, OK, we're going to open it up to all courts in the land. Let go the, go the opposite extreme. So then you've got the possibility of diverging interpretations of any court in the UK, bearing in mind that within the UK we've got three different legal systems as it is. Don't forget that, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. So what's that going to do? Go figure. Yeah, yeah. Question.